Throughout history, there have been many examples of artists and musicians who are particularly interested in the technology used to make and record music, manipulating these technologies to create interesting new pathways for interacting with sound. They have creatively examined what happens when these recording and playback technologies fail, purposefully manipulating things like tape, CDs and vinyls to create glitches and breaks and expand our conception of what sounds can be considered musical. William Bozinski famously examined the fragility of tape in The Disintegration Loops, a four volume album in which 20 year old tapes of his previous music were looped and gradually deteriorate as the tape head wore away more and more of the recorded material with each repetition until there was nothing left. Yasunao Tone interrogated CD players with Solo for Wounded CD by placing pieces of scotch tape on the CD to confuse the player's built-in error correction software, resulting in distorted information and glitchy bursts of sound. And Maria Chavez is a turntablist, DJ, and sound artist from Peru, who utilizes broken equipment and vinyl records to inject indeterminacy and instability into her work. Calling herself an instigator of chance, she constructs vibration sculptures, which collapse and are rebuilt through her performances. As she explains in an interview with Daniel Neumann, objects deteriorate and as a result, new sound opportunities exist. By experiencing chance situations during performance, this created the basis of developing my vocabulary with the turntable. The more that went wrong, the more I learned about new sound possibilities, i.e. when a needle broke a certain way, it began making interesting sounds on different records. The more they broke, the more sound began to emerge that wouldn't have without accidents and damage. Accidents, chance, coincidences, to me, are the root of new beginnings in anything. In this case, it was with the turntable. The new Data Bender module by Qubit is an instrument which is inspired by what happens when audio technologies fail. It emulates things like glitching software, skipping CDs, and broken tape machines to create often unpredictable results which can inspire new ways of listening and alternative approaches to composition. With all this in mind, let's take a look at the Data Bender to see what it can do. So Data Bender works by recording the incoming audio from the left and right inputs here into what's called a buffer, and you can sort of just think of that as a chunk of audio. We can determine the size of that chunk and how often it's replaced using the time knob here. All the way to the left and we'll have a 16 second chunk of audio, and all the way to the right we'll get a new chunk of audio 80 times a second. So quite a range of possibilities there. And you can see every time the clock LED flashes here, we get a new buffer of audio. Once we have something in our buffer, we can divide it into repeated chunks using the repeats knob here. The further the knob is turned to the right, the more divisions we have, and the faster the audio comes out. We also have an overall mix knob, so we can blend between the original signal and what's being processed by the data bender. Now let's take a look at how this module can process audio to make it sound all glitchy and broken. So the data bender has two modes, macro and micro, as indicated by this LED over here, blue for macro and green for micro. The different modes affect how these two bend and break knobs behave. First, we're gonna take a look at the macro mode. In this mode, the effects of the bend and break processing that we apply are controlled by the clock, which again, you can see flashing here. Every time the clock pulses, the audio in the buffer gets processed in a different way. It's like it sort of generates new settings for the bend and break processes that it's applying to the audio. Therefore, in this mode, the data bender can do a lot of the work for us and keep generating unexpected and unpredictable sounds. If we just take a look at bend for a moment first, with the bend knob, the data bender will manipulate the incoming audio with effects inspired by physical media like tape and vinyl. For example, it can change the speed and pitch of the sound, reverse it, add vinyl clicks and pops, and tape stop effects. We can turn the effect on and off with the button here, and at the lowest settings, the effects are more subtle. So you can hear there's a little bit of reversing going on occasionally there. But when we turn the knob further, the effects get more and more pronounced. So there you can hear that it's sort of sliding between different tape speeds and reversing, which I really like the sound of. Break, on the other hand, 
emulates malfunctioning digital equipment like CDs and software bugs. The effects on offer here are glitches and stutters similar to a scratched CD, disjointed playhead movement and synchronised audio dropouts. Again we can turn the effect on and off here and there is only a slight chance for the effects to occur when the knob is on lower settings. But as we turn the knob up, the module adds more repeats, jumps around different sections of the buffer and adds silence to each repeat too. If we flip over to micro mode by pressing the button here, then the bend and break knobs give us different effects which are not dictated by the module's clock. The bend knob now allows us to manipulate the playback speed of our buffer, so if we turn to the right we can speed it up and slow it down if we turn it to the left, which is super useful, I really like this effect. If the LED here is a cyan colour, like that, then it indicates that we are a specific octave above or below the playback speed, which is really handy. Otherwise, the LED is a darker blue. If we press the bend button now, instead of turning off the effect, we reverse the buffer. To indicate that we are reversing the buffer, the LED has changed to green and gold instead of blue and cyan. So that's at the normal playback speed, but just reversed. The brake knob also now gives us new controls in micro mode. If the LED is not illuminated and the repeat knob is turned up, then the brake knob allows us to move between different sections of the buffer, therefore repeating different parts of our incoming audio. So if I make the buffer a bit bigger and turn up the repeats a bit more. This allows us to skip between different parts of our buffer. If we press the button and turn the LED on, the knob now allows us to add different amounts of silence to our buffer. With the knob on the far left there will be no silence, and on the far right 90% of the buffer will be replaced with silence. The final knob that we have over here is called Corrupt, and it allows us to process our audio in three more ways. Now this knob is completely independent of the clock and it doesn't change depending on whether the module is in macro or micro mode. When the LED here is blue, this knob controls a combination of bit crushing and downsampling. I'll just sweep through the options here. So as far as bit crushing and downsampling go, it's quite versatile, it gives you a lot of different options. If we press the corrupt button, the LED turns green, and now the knob instead controls random audio dropouts. If the knob is to the left, then fewer but longer dropouts occur. And as we turn the knob to the right, the dropouts get shorter, but there are more of them. Finally, if we press the button again, the LED turns gold and the knob applies distortion instead. At lower settings, the knob applies a gentle saturation. And as we turn it up, we start to get hard clipping. So now that we have an overview of how the module works, let's take a listen to a few quick examples of the module in context. So in this patch, we've got quite a dynamic and unpredictable result, but it's actually quite a simple patch. So if I take down all of the processing so we can hear what we're starting with, we are starting with the Kalimba sample from Nebulae and we're not changing the speed or pitch or anything there. We're just sending it straight to the data bender. And here we have three different processes going on. We've got the bend, break and corrupt. And we've also got a few repeats over here. Um, if I just take out these so we can hear the effects one at a time, with the smooth output from Chance, we're controlling the brake knob. And we can hear some of the repeats there going on as well. Uh, with the discrete output from Chance, 
we are controlling the bend, which is giving us some of those, in fact, if I turn it all the way up so we can hear better, we're hearing those um, tape effects, the reverses, the speed changes. And then with the blend, I am here adding some of the corruption, so the, the downsampling and the um, bit rate changes. And then blending that with the original signal and sending it to clouds. Now if I turn up clouds here, we've got a bit of reverb. We've got the pitch all the way up, which makes it sound quite ethereal. So if I put that on fully wet, this is what clouds is doing. And we've got quite large grains and the grains are being generated not fully but um, to a point where we can sort of hear some of the individual grains coming in and out. So if I then blend that with the signal coming out of data bender, we get a nice mix. This example is also quite simple and shows you how, with just a few parameters, DataBender can really transform your sounds and give you some interesting results. So if I turn down clouds, so we can hear what's coming out of DataBender. This is what I've got. Originally, we had this sample coming from the nebulae here. Again, I'm not changing the speed or pitch or anything like that. If I turn up the mix all the way, you can hear that we've completely transformed that sample into something different. And we are chopping up the sample using some repeats here, which gives it a bit of rhythm and structure. And we are in the micro mode here, uh, as indicated by the green LED, which means that the bend knob is controlling the playback speed. So we've reversed it and slowed it down a little bit. I've also added a little bit of saturation to thicken it up. Then that's being sent over to clouds, which is Again, just adding some etherealness, pitching the sample up, feeding some grains um, to the left and right stereo field, and just making it a bit more interesting and dynamic. And that could really easily be used as a layer in a track or a piece. Now this is a bit more of an extreme example which shows how DataBender can really mess up and mangle the audio that you send through. Originally we are just starting with a drum sample from Greg Fox who's a brilliant drummer and also really into modular synthesizers. And if we go to fully wet on the DataBender, we can hear just how completely the DataBender is mangling the sound. But again, only with a couple of parameters. We are using the repeats to chop the sample up, repeat it, and make it sound a bit more chaotic. We're using the corrupt here to saturate it, so that's without, and that's with. Uh, but mainly we're using this break, so that's just the repeats on their own. But with this extra break uh, processing, we add another layer of chaos and unpredictability and then blending that back in with the drum sample. We've sort of created an accompaniment to the original drum sample, which is made out of that drum sample itself, which I think is quite an interesting idea. And I'm just running it through clouds to add some gain. I'm not actually processing it here. And of course, you don't just have to use samples with the data bender, you can also use synthesis. So this is, again, a very simple example. We're just taking the output from chord that's going into clouds. If I turn off what data bender is doing there, we can hear that we're saturating it by turning up the gain and adding a lot of reverb. And it's also on the uh, crunchier sort of tape setting. Uh, if I go into here, it's on this stereo tape setting here. And I'm sending that up to DataBender. And we're just adding some corruption here. If I turn up the mix to add some dropouts. 
and the aim of this patch was to try and get a sort of disintegration loops-esque effect here and make it sound like the sound itself is sort of falling apart and disintegrating. So as well as chaotic sounds, the data bender can add some quite subtle effects. So there you go. I hope that this video has helped you to become more curious about the sounds and techniques that can be used in your own music. I'd like to thank Qubit for sponsoring this video and making it possible. If you'd like to check out the data bender or any of their other brilliant modules, you can check out their website, which I've linked to in the description below. If you want to learn more about the people and topics discussed in this video, then you can also check out the description where I've left a bunch of links to articles, videos, and books, which may be of interest. I would particularly recommend Kim Cascone's essay, The Aesthetics of Failure, which I borrowed the title of for this particular video. And that can be found in this fantastic book, Audio Culture, um, edited by Christoph Cox and Daniel Warner. I'll once again echo Cascone by finishing with a quote from Luigi Russolo's seminal manifesto, The Art of Noises, from 1913. We therefore invite young musicians of talent to conduct a sustained observation of all noises in order to understand the various rhythms of which they are composed, their principal and secondary tones. By comparing the various tones of noises with those of sounds, they will be convinced of the extent to which the former exceeds the latter. This will afford not only an understanding, but also a taste and passion for noises. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Thank <laughs> you.